Jonah chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. We're going to work our way through the entire book today. It's going to be fast, but I'm just going to start with this one. I'll pray, and then I'll let you have a seat. So Jonah chapter 1, verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. Let's go ahead and pray. Lord Jesus, I pray that you would speak to us today through your word. God, we ask that you would help us to understand um, how gracious and compassionate you are. But Lord, that it would also not be lost on us how powerful you are. And God, may we be able to rejoice today when we are able to, to see that you are more committed to our repentance than we ourselves are. God, may we not spurn that. May we not um, begrudge that. Lord, may we rejoice in that. God, could we, would you allow us to just take and see ourselves in the book of Jonah today? And may we get to the point where we can finish the book and rejoice in the God that you are. And we ask it in Jesus' good, good name. Amen. Amen. You may have a seat. Go ahead. Um, welcome to the table. My name is Cody. I get to be one of the pastors uh, here. We have got two other guys, uh, one preached here a few weeks ago uh david uh reese preached on the book of amos next week we got dan um bell who's going to be pre another uh, of our elders gonna be preaching on the book of micah and um we are just rejoicing at, at the things that god is doing within our church the elders the leaders that he's raising up and um we're we're especially excited about this series called the minor prophets now these are the last 12 books in the old testament so these are the books that come right before the new testament and they're called the Minor Prophets. They're not called Minor Prophets because what they have to say is less important than the other books in the Bible. They're only called Minor Prophets because they're shorter. Like Genesis is 50 chapters, Jonah is 4. Obadiah, which we preached a last week, I think, was one chapter. So typically the Minor Prophets are just shorter in nature, but they're not less important. They just are condensed. So with that idea... Let's look at answer this question. Can you run from God? We read it here that, I mean, it says three times in three verses that Jonah went down to Tarshish, down to Tarshish. He went to Tarshish. Twice it says he went away from the presence of the Lord, away from the presence of the Lord. So that gets the question. like, okay, well, this guy is supposed to be a prophet. This guy is supposed to be one of on God's, he's one of the guys that's on God's team, and yet he's not doing what God wants him to do. So it begs the question, can you run from God? For a little while. Yeah. For a little while. But here's the thing. You, and you need to know this. It's really hard to run from someone who is everywhere who knows everything and can do anything. That's not a fun guy to play hide and go seek with. I was I, I, I was running this last week in my neighborhood, and I and I, I I don't always run. Sometimes it's walking, but I was running this week, and I've I've ran enough now in my neighborhood that I see this guy about the same time in the morning. He's and I don't know what kind of dog this is. Okay, I it, I. If, if y'all know what kind it is when I describe it, you can yell it out. We're that small of a church. It's fine, okay? It's shaped like a weenie dog, so it's long and has a little bit short legs on the end. But it's real hairy. It ain't short hair. It's, it's longer and shaggier, and it's got a little bit snub-nosed face. It kind of looks like a, like, a, like a Boston Terrier or a Bulldog or something like that, but, again, long hair. I don't know what kind of dog that is. A chubacabra. There you go. That's what it is, chubacabra. So... I saw the mythical beast this week. And I've ran in my neighborhood enough to know that this dog 
Boy, he's protective of his owner, and his owner's probably in his 70s and stuff, nice, kind, gentle old man. We've only waved and stuff. We've never really had too much of a conversation. But I know that this dog is going to start barking at me, and he's going to act like he's going to do something. So I just go ahead, and I, I'll go to the other side of the street or whatever. And so this particular morning this week, I've passed him a couple of different times, and I'm coming up to pass him, and he's, cut, he's taken off through this green belt. And I, and I look over, and this... This, this man is, is walking this dog, but it ain't, he ain't walking the dog. He is dragging the dog. Because the dog knows that I'm coming up behind him, and the dog is wanting to like go back and try to get me. And, and so the man is walking. The leash is at a 45-degree angle behind him. And this dog has got all four paws dug in, and, he, and, it, and, the, and the leash is on his neck. But the dog is still trying to be like, look behind his shoulder to see where I'm at. I don't care what that dog wanted or what that dog thought it could do, but he was not going to get away from his master. Wasn't going to get away from his owner. That man was more committed to his direction than that dog was to his and when i ran by that and i saw that, i was like i was like oh man well that looks a whole lot like god and jonah right there and then the holy spirit went to work on me and said yeah it looks like looks a whole lot like you sometimes too cody yes yes sir yes sir it does and i'm guessing that i'm not the only one so what i want to do is as we get into this i want us to see that I want us to see and I want us to praise God that he is more committed to his way and his way becoming our way than we are to our own way and running away from him. God is more committed to our repentance than we are. And that's a good, good thing. So first thing we got a question, just to do a little bit of background, we've got to figure out why did Jonah try to flee from God? Well, because he asked him to go to Nineveh, Nineveh was the capital city of the Assyrians, and the Assyrians were enemies of God's people. They had done some really, really bad things to Israel. There's a lot of stuff going on right now in the, in the, in the uh, news today about Israel and Hamas and the attacks and stuff. like. Think of it like that. Think of it like God has spoken to an Israelite, a prophet, a preacher, and told him to go and preach to Hamas. You ma that's the kind of, like they've done damage they've inflicted pain and and Jonah's like I don't want to go to them now we, we, there's all kinds of reasons why we can speculate why he didn't want to go but when we get to the end of the book we're going to see exactly why he didn't want to go is because he hated them he didn't want God to save them he didn't want God to do anything with them he he, he thought that they were hell-bound and hell-deserving, and he wasn't going to do a thing to lift his finger to help them get any other direction. That's why he went away. That's what we learned in chapter 4. So it brings us to the questions, can you run from God's will? Well, for a little while, according to these first three verses. But, like I said, running from someone who is everywhere, knows everything, and can do anything, that's, that's, a, that's a tall task. The reality is you cannot outrun the will of God. You cannot outrun the will of God. Look at verses 4 through 6. Verses 1 and 2 say, but, or verse 1 and 2 say what God told Jonah to do. Verse 3 says, but Jonah. But verse 4 says, but the Lord. Okay? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord that he is contrasting to us. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea. See, I told you, he can do whatever he wants to do. So that the ship threatened to break apart or break up. Then the mariners were afraid, and each cried out to his God, and they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. They're doing whatever they can. But then we have another contrasting thing. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship and had lain down and was fast asleep totally aloof to what is going on around him and that's how it happens a lot of times when we run from the lord 
when we get so bent on going our own way, we become just aloof to the other things going on around us. We become very, very self-centered. Verse 6, so the captain came and said to him, what do you mean, you sleeper? I think sleeper is meant to be a little bit derogatory here. You know, lazy bones, you know, you know, get the eye boogers out of your eye. What are you doing here, man? You know, what do you mean, you sleeper? Arise, call out to your God. Like, we're all calling out to our God. Nothing's working. Lift help. That we're, our lives are in danger here. Perhaps the, perhaps the God will give a thought to us and we may not perish. God hurled a great wind upon the sea. Well, from where did he hurl it? Did he have to make a trip to go get it somewhere and then come back? No. He's everywhere. And he knows everything. And he can do anything. He just reached and grabbed some and poof, chunked it onto the sea. Just that simply. It, I mean, to illustrate this, it's like God hurling this wind upon the sea. This is not like God having to st step up to a tee box and stripe a 400-yard drive right down the middle and land it in, you know, a, a five-yard width. This is more like an inch tap-in putt. Like, he, he, this is not a hard thing for God to do to hurl a wind upon this boat and upon this sea. It's not a hard thing for him to do. The reality is, and we're going to see this throughout the book of Jonah, is that God controls all of nature, regardless of our awareness of it. The, the mariners, the sailors on this ship, they, didn't, they weren't aware of what was going on. They didn't know who was in control of this thing. So they're just trying to do anything. It's God. That's in control of it. And also, God is in control of all the things that are going on in your life as well. He's either appointed them or he has allowed them. The God that we worship, the God that we are preaching about, the God that we prayed to just a while ago, the God that we are going to sing to here in just a little bit, this is not a God that sits in heaven wringing his hands, fraught with worry about how, how things are going to end up. That's not a God worthy of worship. This is a God that is in control of everything, even if we don't like it. So we move on down. What happens in verses 7 through 10 is Jonah does wake up. He goes, that's ah, my fault. Go ahead and throw me into the sea. Just chuck me overboard. And they're like, oh, let's not do that. They're trying to come up with other things. They don't, they're not wanting to you know, have his blood on their hands. But finally, eventually, they do. They do throw him into the sea. And then they pray, God, please don't hold this against us. Verses 11 through 16, that's what they say. They say, what shall we do to you that the sea might quiet down for us? For the sea grew more and more tempestuous. And that, that's a word, it, it, it grew bigger. Like it, They're doing all these things and the sea's just getting worse and worse and worse. And he said to them, pick me up, hurl me into the sea, then the sea will calm down. For you, I know that it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. Nevertheless, the men rode hard. That's typically what we try to do. That's typically what, if we don't have a relationship with the Lord, if we're not wor worshipers of the true God, when things get hard in our life, we typically, we just start trying harder. And that, So these guys are doing what's natural. They rode hard. Nevertheless, they, they couldn't get back to dry land. They, they tried to get back to dry land, but they could not. For the sea grew more and more tempestuous. Second time it's said. Therefore they called out the Lord, O Lord, please or let us not perish for this man's life and lay not on us innocent blood. For you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. You see it? They come, they come to grips with like, we're not in control. God is. This God. Jonah's God. He's in control. Not us. O Lord, you have done as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah, hurled him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. And the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and vows. Like, we see that like God is at work even through Jonah's disobedience, even through his hard-headedness, even through his hard-heartedness, God is still at work. And that's an encouraging thing for us. You don't have to be perfect for God to work through you. That You don't. He's powerful enough 
that he can work despite your issues. Praise the Lord, right? I mean, isn't that good news? So, verse 17. This is probably what Jonah, the book of Jonah is the most famous for. And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. So God has, in control of wind, and he's also in control of fish, even the big ones. Now, some people look at this and they say, this, this right here, this is where the Bible, this is a myth. I don't think it's a myth. Um, and the reason I don't believe it's a myth is because Jesus spoke about this issue and he seemed to take it as historical fact. He said, as Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights, three nights, so the Son of Man will be in the belly of the earth for three days and three nights. He's, 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 he's seeing that this is real. This is literal. God is in control of great winds. He's in control of great fishes. He is everywhere. He knows all the fish. He knows every one of them. You say, well, how do you know he knows all the fish? Because Jesus said he knows how many hairs are on each one of our heads. He knows how many feathers a sparrow has. And we're worth way, way more to him than that. He knows everything. And he can do anything he wants to with them. He can do what he wants to with the wind. He can do what he wants to with the fish. He can do what he wants to with you and with me. He's in control. The reason that you cannot outrun the will of God is because God is more committed to your repentance than you are. In the same way that God was more committed to Jonah's repentance than Jonah was. So we get to chapter 2, verses 1 through 9, and this seems like, like... He's got his attention. Listen to what listen to chapter two, verses one through nine. Now keep in mind where Jonah is. Verse one tells us Then Jonah prayed to the Lord, his God, from the belly of the fish. I don't know about you, but if I was in the belly of the fish, I think that I think that's who I'd be praying to too. And but listen to what he says. I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol, which was the grave, the, or the depths. Out of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the sea, and the flood surrounded me. Now, that's a little bit different, because the Lord didn't cast him into the sea. Jonah asked to be put into the sea. You see, but, but it's fine, you know. You cast me in the deep into the heart of the sea. The flood surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. Then I said, I am driven away from your sight. No, you ran away from the presence of the Lord. You weren't driven away. And I said, I'm driven away from your sight. Yet I shall look, uh, yet, yet I shall again look upon your holy temple. The waters, uh, holy temple, the waters closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. At the roots of the mountains. Why roots of mountains? Yeah, because you know he, he's seeing the base. He, he like presumably like in, and he don't know how deep this whale is going, but he, he's he's in it. He's as low as you can get. I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. Yet you brought my life up from the pit, O Lord my God. Like he's he's remembering the goodness of God. He's He's reflecting on his life. He's like, this probably wasn't a good decision. When my life was fainting away, I remember the Lord and my prayer came to you into your holy temple. Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. But with the voice of thanksgiving, I will, will I sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. He get, he, he, this is Jonah's dark night of the soul. He has been brought to nothing. He has... No more resources. He has no more safety nets. He has absolutely nothing. Have you been there? Are you there now? Jonah's repentance. This is the part one. And this is what basically the whole rest of the book of Jonah is about. Is his repentance. Repentance part one, chapter two, is about this dark night of the soul. Rarely do we ever make any lasting change in our lives until there's a significant enough amount of pain 
where we have to make that change. Somebody said it like this, that the, we won't change until the pain of the change is less than the pain of staying the same. The pain of remaining. So where are your pain points? What is it that, what, what, where is your dark night? What are you dealing with? What is it that you need to repent from, and why are you scared to do it? What's keeping you from doing that? For Jonah, it was his prejudice. He did not want the Ninevites to be um, saved. He, did, he wanted destruction to come upon them. Here's the thing. God will get his will accomplished, even if it means doing so by extraordinary means even if it means bringing a storm into your life, even if it means bringing something into your life that is going to swallow you up. God is so committed to, your, to His will, and His will is good and it is perfect. He is so committed to that that He will, by extraordinary means, bring you into alignment with it. So what does God do? He brings Jonah to a dark place. Why? Because he's more committed to Jonah's repentance than Jonah is. Jonah, or God will bring dark, he will put you in dark places to get you to talk to him, to get you to wrestle with your issue. Chapter 3 moves us on into Jonah's repentance part 2. You would think that Jonah would be, I mean this could work as a minor prophet book just to end right there and, and at the end of, of chapter, chapter 2 verse 9. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Great ending. Like, great. He, Jonah's done it. But that's not where it ends. We, we have this little funny, I think it's a funny verse, but we have verse 10. You know, verse 10. I, we don't have it on the slide, but I'm going to read it for you. And the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah out upon the dry land. We always look at this from God's point of view or from Jonah's point of view. I don't think anybody's looked at it from the fish's point of view. Like the fish is like, oh, I don't think I should have ate that. Ooh. Ooh. Honey, can you give me some Pepto-Bismol? Oh, this is, excuse me, I'll be back in a little bit. Swims over here to the coast. Blech. Jonah comes out alive, thankfully, probably a little bleached, you know, from the acids going on. Imagine being in the belly of a fish, and then all of a sudden, for three days, three nights, in abject darkness. It's not like he took a flashlight down there. Like, I'm always amazed at these photos of, like, you know, Jonah... Like he's got a little tent down there, a little campfire, and he's roasting weenies inside the belly. Like, listen, like this, this fish is probably circling and doing. You know, I mean, if he's got a sore stomach, he's probably trying to get in all kinds of positions, trying to figure out how to get this thing worked out, right? Like he's he's trying to work these things out. So Jonah's down in an abject darkness. Then he gets vomited out onto the shoreline, and bright light. It's kind of like looking straight into that one. Like it's just like golly. He's been through it. So you'd think that verse 9 would be a great place to end it, but that's not what happens. Look at verse, verse uh, 1 of chapter 3. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and call out against it the message that I tell you. Here's the thing. When God tells you to do something, and he's, you're not going to bargain with him. He's not going to change his mind. Like it stays the same. He just reiterates the same thing. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, three days' journey in breadth. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's journey. So he goes into the, into the city for one day without saying a word. And then he calls out, and it's the shortest sermon of any of the prophets ever. Yet 40 days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Is that it? 
Jonah doesn't even say yes. He just looks at him. Walks for another day. Goes out of the city. Now look at this. Verse 5. And the people of Nineveh believed God. Jonah never even told him to believe God. He just said, you're going to die. There's no hope for you. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They called for a fast. Some of y'all don't even fast. They called for a fast and put on sackcloth. From the greatest of them to the least of them. Not just like one trailer park. Not just like one Beverly Hills area. No, the greatest to the least. Like this revival sweeps across the city. Now, we know from history there have been a lot of things that were going on in the nation of Assyria, particularly in the nation or in the city of Nineveh, and they were ripe for being able to hear from God. And God knew it. So God appointed one of his men to go and tell them. The man didn't want to do it. There are people that you work with, that you go to school with, that are in your neighborhood, that are ripe for an invitation to church, an invitation to believe God. There is all kinds of stuff going on in their life. They have been brought, they, they have gone through their own dark night of the soul, and God has appointed you to go to them, and instead of you inviting, instead of you telling, many of you are running away from the presence of the Lord. You have no idea what God is doing and how He is speaking into other people's lives. And they're just waiting for an invitation. Now, not everybody. I'm not saying every single person is. I, I'm not saying that. But many of them are. Jonah had no idea what God was going to do with this simple message. Verse 6, the word reached the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, sat in ashes. He issued a proclamation and published through Nineveh. By the decree of the king and the nobles, let neither men nor beast nor herd or flock taste anything. Like, listen, this, this fast is not voluntary now. This is, involunt this is a proclamation. We're all fasting. We're all getting right before God. Let everyone turn from his evil way. That's repentance. Let everyone turn from his evil way and let the and from violence of, that is in his hand. That's what Jonah was upset about the Assyrians, the violence that they had done to them. And now the king is saying, we got to stop this. And Jonah isn't happy that they've repented. We're going to see that in chapter 4. So, and, but then you also see in verse 9, the, the king says, who knows? Like he's desperate. He has no security. Who knows? God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. He was, he was like, I'm, we're just going to try this. He's not that much different than, than the sailors just throwing stuff overboard, hoping that something works out. But then we get to see how God is toward those who repent. And what, it, how, what is God like toward those who repent? Verse 10. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, when he saw their repentance, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. When we repent, God relents. We repent, God relents. That's, that's how it works. God is disposed, he is predisposed toward grace. God is never going to tell you, listen, that he may tell you, you better shut this down or I'm going to get you. He may do that. He may tell you, you better stop this. You got three days. Here's what God's never going to do. God's never going to say, stop it. You got three days to obey me. And then on day two, yeah, I'm done with you. His bend is always to wait at least three days and we see it over and over in scripture where he waits more than that over and over and over God's predisposition 
God's bent is towards grace, not towards judgment. So Jonah's repentance, part two, is at least a physical repentance. He goes and he does what God tells him to do. He goes to Nineveh. He says what God tells him to say. I would say the bare minimum. He, God restates his will. Jonah obeys in verses three and four. And the result in verses five through nine is people repent of their sin and they believe God. Jonah had one of the most effective ministries of all the people in the Old Testament. It was certainly the most efficient. An entire city repented and believed God from one sermon. We're not even told that he spoke this one sermon over and over and over again. There's no indication that he kept saying it. God relents from the disaster. So that's Jonah's repentance part two. Jonah's repentance part one is the dark night of the soul being brought to the end of himself. Repentance part two is actually doing what God told him to do, but that's not where repentance stops. Jonah chapter four is the third part of Jonah's repentance, which I call hard heart conversation where God starts asking a lot of really, really good questions. Let's go ahead and read it. Why does God ask these kinds of questions? Why does God keep pursuing Jonah? Because God is more committed to Jonah's repentance than Jonah is. Just physical obedience, just doing what God says. He's like, I don't want, I just don't, Jonah, I'm not just after your compliance. I'm after your heart. I want your heart to reflect my heart toward people. I want your heart to be moved towards compassion and grace. That's what I want for you, Jonah. You're, you're compliant. You've done what I've said because I've brought you to this place, but I'm after your heart. What is he mad about? Let's go ahead and look at this. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, verse 1, and he was angry. And he prayed to the Lord. And You ever prayed angry? It's okay too. It, it, it's better to it's it's better to go to God in your anger, even when you're angry with Him, than to just be sullen and go pout in the corner and don't say anything to Him. That's what He tried to do when He got on the boat. Now He's talking to Him. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly. He was angry and he prayed to the Lord and he said, "O oh Lord, is not this what I said when I was yet in my own country?" That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. For I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful and slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. That's what you're mad at him about? That's what you're mad at God about? Jonah? Yeah. But he didn't even stop there. Verse 3, therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me. For it is, now, I didn't say this. This is, this is, the Bible says this next word. For it is better for me to die than to live. Jonah, you know that just three days ago you were in a fish. And that's not the song you were singing then. My word, how forgetful we are. And God, you can just picture this with just this still, small voice. The Lord said, Do you do well to be angry? That's a real good question. I don't know what kind of dark soul, dark night of the soul you're in. I don't know what belly of what fish you're in. I don't know where you're at right now. But I think that's a real good question to ask. And I think when we read God's word and we see God asking these questions of his saints, I think we ought to go ahead and ask those questions of ourselves and let God ask those questions of us. So if you would just permit me for just a second, can you just allow yourself to let God ask you, do you, be, do, you do well 
to be angry? Jonah is mad that God spared his enemies. Jonah would rather die than live in a world where his God saves his enemies. Jonah knows what God is like, but he doesn't like that he is that way toward jo Jonah's enemies. It's fine for God to be that way toward me, but I don't like the fact that he's that way towards other people. I don't want him to be that nice to other people. See how deep this goes down, this, this prejudice, this hatred? The reality is Jonah was out of the dark belly of a fish, but he was not out of the dark night of the soul. He still had to wrestle with things. God is bringing him face to face with his hate and with his anger. Why? Why was God asking? Was God being a smart aleck when, he let, when Jonah goes on this rant in his prayer and then God asks just a simple question? Was he trying to needle Job? Was he just trying to, be, just trying to irritate him? No. He's asking really, really good questions. Why? Because God is committed to more to Jonah's repentance than Jonah is. And God will ask you those types of questions because he is more committed to your repentance than you are. He has to be. I don't know where you're at. Or maybe you're there now. But I, can I just tell you that he knows. Brother, sister in Christ, he knows. He's not He's not trying to make your life miserable because he wants you to be miserable for the rest of your life. It's not that. But he is willing to bring in pain. He is willing to bring in suffering to bring you to a spot where you can repent and you can trust him. And in his kindness, he's showing that to you by asking those questions. We go on and we see here in the last few verses of, of Jonah that God is not done dealing with nature yet. Look at verse 5. Jonah went out of the city and sat to the east of the city. By the way, in the Old Testament, anytime somebody goes east, that ain't good. That is a sign that they are running away from the presence of the Lord. Jonah went out of the city, sat to the east of the city, and made a booth for himself. So he gets some logs, he makes like a duck blind, you know, puts a roof over it. And he sat under it in the shade till he should see what would become of the city. Like he's still hoping that fire will fall upon the city. He's going to get himself a good seat and just look and see what's going to happen. Now the Lord appointed a plant. He's appointed a wind. He's appointed a fish. Now he appoints a plant. And he made it come up over Jonah that it might be a shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. Man, isn't that nice of God? To, to save him from his discomfort. How kind of God. Jonah's got, just got this whirlwind of emotions going on. And he goes, you know what? I'm going to give him a little bit of relief right now. How kind of God. So Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant. But that's how verse 7. But when dawn came the next day, God appointed a worm. A wind, fish, plant, a worm. That attacked the plant so that it withered. And when the sun rose, oh, God's still jacking with nature. God appointed a scorching east wind. Not a powerful wind to come along, a scorching east wind. I think it probably came all the way from Phoenix like a hot air dryer. Right? You know, just all the way around the planet. And <laughs> Let's just bring Jonah a little bit of this Phoenix weather here. A scorching east wind and the sun to beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint. And he asked that he might die. This is like the third time. Jonah has asked to die or tried to die in this book. He is not a picture of emotional health. And he said, it is better for me to die than to live. Which, by the way, psychologically, it's the same thing he said earlier in chapter, it, it's the same thing. 
it, and we get rooted. When we start saying those things, that like those ruts get formed in our mind and we say the same things over and over and over. Have you been there? Have you said things to yourself? You know, I remember this one preacher one time, he was a pretty good sized guy and you know, he wasn't particularly all that good looking. He said he was at the end of a sermon, it was a hard day, and he said the devil just climbed up on his shoulder and started accusing him. He said, you're fat. You're ugly. Nobody likes you. And he goes, I just thought to myself, the devil's a liar. I'm not going to believe any of that. Some of the times you just have to say, you know what, the devil's a liar. Because he is. Better for me that I should die than live. But God said to Jonah, same question. Do you do well to be angry about the plant? God's not trying to be a smart aleck. He's asking a really good question. Then he goes and he, and he says more. And the Lord said, You pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did, make, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and perished in night. And then he asked another question. Should I not pity Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left and also much cattle? God appoints a plant, a worm, and another wind to restart the conversation. God asks really, really good, kind questions. Which we're told in the book of Romans that it is God's kindness that leads us to repentance. He's more committed to your repentance than you are. And praise Him for that. The reality is, we don't know how Jonah answered those questions. That's the last verse of the Bible. It, the, last, the last word in the Bible is cattle. And there's a question mark. We don't know. We don't know what Jonah did. We don't know how Jonah answered those questions, but we know that Jesus used Jonah to point to the ultimate act of God's kindness. When Jonah was in the, as Jonah was in the belly of the fish to bring him to repentance so that Jonah's enemies would be spared, Jesus was in the belly of the earth and died and was buried in the depths of the earth so that God's enemies, us, could not just be spared, but brought into his family and be made a part of his family so that we could have a seat at the table. So, my invitation to you today is to repent. This is what God was trying to get Jonah to do. If you're not a Christian, your repentance is going to look like, God, I repent for not trusting you, for not believing you. I want you to be my Savior. I want you to save me. I want you to be my Lord. That's what your repentance looks like if you've never done it. And you can pray something very, very simple. It goes like this. It doesn't have to be in my exact words, but in your heart of hearts, you just say, God, I'm a sinner. And I'm but I don't want I, I want to be yours would you please forgive me I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sin I believe that he rose from the dead and I believe that he has a power to change my life so Lord I'm, I'm asking would you change my life the Bible says that if you believe that in your heart and you confess that with your mouth you will be saved the Bible says that God demonstrates his own love for us and that while we were still sinners Christ died for us on the cross says that the wages of sin is death but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So if you're not a Christian, I want to invite you to become a Christian today. And that means just repenting of not believing in Jesus and believing in Jesus. And if you do that today, if you prayed that prayer, if something changed and turned over in your heart I want you to tell somebody today. Somebody that you came here, maybe you came here to see Vera baptized you're a friend of hers or family member or maybe this is your first time ever walking into this church and just tell, tell somebody. We'll have people at the info table. You tell Adam, you come tell me. I'll be back there in the lobby at the end. But we would love to hear that and walk with you like, what does your next steps look like? If you're a Christian, like Jonah, I believe, was, if you're a Christian, what is the thing that God is asking you to change? What is the thing that God is asking you to repent of? Where is that, what, what are the deep-seated issues that God is bringing to light so that you can turn from those? I don't know. But God does, and you do.
and he's more committed to your repentance than you are. And I really don't want to see you wind up in the belly of a fish. I if you can get out of that dark night of the soul by just laying it before him and letting him have complete control, it's a good, good place to be. It's scary. I know. It's unfamiliar. I know. But it's better. It's better than where you're at now. So that's the invitation. Repent. If you're not a believer, repent. Believe in Jesus. If you are a believer, repent. It, you're, you're never beyond it. We're always supposed to be. Number two, we're going to experience baptism here in just a little bit. If you've never been baptized, we want to invite you to, let's, let's get baptized. Let's have a conversation. Let's start that. Let, you know, if that's something you've been thinking about, we, we want to invite you into a conversation about that. You're going to hear, hear a story, and we're going to see it. We're going to celebrate that. We'd love to celebrate that with you as well. I want to invite you to plug into a church. Plug, plug into our church. Plug into another church that's near your house. You know, but plug into a church. If you want to plug in here, there's a couple ways you can do that. We want to invite you to plug into a group. Go to one of our classes. Come to membership class or, or baptism class. Come to our newcomers events coming up here in just a couple of weeks. Come and learn about what it means to be a member of this church, what it means to be um, an attender here. We'd love to to just tell you. We've got nothing to hide. If you're a Christian, we want to invite you to come and take communion here in just a moment. Juice representing His blood that He shed for us. Bread representing His perfect righteousness that's been imputed to us. That's where we find our identity. So here in just a minute, people are going to get up as we start to sing. People that are baptized believers are going to come down this aisle. They're going to take communion elements. They're going to come back to their seat. They're going to take those in stillness and quietness. And Angie and Zach are going to start leading us. And we're going to stand one by one. People are going to start popping up. And we're going to sing. And even if you don't take communion, we want to invite you to sing. Sing to this God that is more committed to you than you could have ever possibly imagined. He's not just against you. He is for you. He loves you. Loves you enough that he sent Christ to die on the cross for your sins. The ultimate act of kindness that leads us to repentance. I'm going to pray for you. I'll let you come and take communion. Jesus, thank you for your grace. Thank you for all that you have done for us. God, would you move among your people now? Good, good.